Welcome back to Paul's Tech News. I don't know what it was this week, you guys. A feeling, a portent of impending disquietude, but something was up. There was an irregularly large quantity of news that happened, just spurting at us from every direction. And while I'm sure many of us could use a cool shower to help out with this summer heat, I believe what we are witnessing is something more. A vast conspiracy, perhaps, to dispense with nearly a month's worth of tech news in a grand deluge to get it all out of the way so the parties involved can just take a couple weeks off? Unlikely, but if I'm able to confirm my theory, I'll let you know. Until then, let's consider these conspiracy theories. Where, for example, did these leaked Intel 13600K benchmarks come from? How have so many reviewers come to the conclusion that the ARC A380 sucks? What is the point of having a domestic chip fab industry in the US if you don't throw $50 billion at it? And perhaps most importantly, when is the appropriate time to ask my viewers to hit that elusive and libidinous like button? The truth will be revealed, and so much more, on this episode of Tech News. Excellent. Today's video was brought to you by the new Lightwings fans from Be Quiet, which combine legendary near silent operation with optimal performance and of course, RGB lighting. Control the look of your PC with up to 20 addressable LEDs per fan and choose from standard PWM for airflow or PWM high speed for use with radiators and heat sinks. They're available in 120 millimeter and 140 millimeter sizes and suitable for any build in need of a functional and tasteful RGB upgrade. So for more on the new Lightwings fans from Be Quiet, click the sponsor link in the video description. Okay, first off, it's too damn hot. It's hot in the US, it's hot in the EU and the UK, which you have to define separately these days. It's hot in other places too, I'm sure, that didn't have easy headlines for me to grab, but before you ask why I'm leading with the weather on a tech news show, allow me to share a dire warning from Nintendo and Valve. Both the Nintendo Switch and the Steam Deck have difficulty operating at higher temperatures. Specifically, above 35 degrees Celsius or 95 Fahrenheit, the Nintendo Switch may overheat and automatically go to sleep, and the Steam Deck may begin to throttle speeds and eventually shut down if its internal temperature goes over 100 C or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Because heavily populated areas that typically don't get that hot are getting up to 40 C and above in the recent heat waves, both Nintendo and Valve tweeted some reminders and suggestions for anyone engaging in mobile gaming while braving the sweltering outdoors and summer heat. Not everyone has an air-conditioned gaming room with a desktop PC cooled by more fans than you can count after after all, but perhaps this mild inconvenience for mobile gaming will convince the world to step up with some much needed solutions for climate change. Oh, I'm, I'm being told that no, that won't happen and we're all doomed. I'm probably just kidding though, but before you have a chance to ruminate on it too carefully, let's pivot to an easy distraction with more Intel Raptor Lake leaks. This time we have numbers from all of the important unlocked SKUs, the 13900K, the 13700K, and the 13600K. WCCF Tech pulled info from the Geekbench 5 and CPU-Z databases to show the 13600K, possibly a future contender for a all-around mid-range gaming chip, running at a base clock of 3.5 gigahertz and a boost of up to 5.1 gigahertz. It's a six P core and eight E core design for 20 threads total with eight E cores instead of the four that the 12600K was set up with. Geekbench showed two entries, one that paired the 13600K with an ASRock Z690 Steel Legend motherboard and one on an Asus ROG Maximus Z690 Extreme. There were also new entries for the flagship 24 core 32 thread 13900K and here is how they match up. CPU-Z shows a significant single core lead for the 12th and 13th gen Intel CPUs over the Ryzen 5000 CPUs, and that is extended with these new scores. Multi-thread results bring the 5950X up ahead of Intel's 12th gen CPUs, but the 13900K is still on top. The 13600K also draws ahead of the previous gen 12600K by almost 3,000 points, going from about 7,200 up to over 10,000, and outpacing the 12700K as well. Geekbench scores are a bit more favorable towards Intel. Here, the single core scores favor 13th gen yet again, and when multi-threaded, the 13600K comes within 500 points of the 5950X. Although it's speculated that those results were reduced a bit with Asus multi-core enhancement and the use of DDR5 memory, hence the boost over the ASRock 13600K results. The middle child 13700K has unofficially debuted in the Geekbench database as well, with an 8P core and 8E core configuration 
transmission for 24 threads total. Again, that's four more E-cores versus the 12700K, and the Raptor Lake variant hit 5.38 gigahertz peak and 5.36 gigahertz on average. Here's how those scores line up versus the others I just mentioned. And yes, the 13700K does appear to outpace the 5950X, even in the multi-core category in this test. And as if to cap off a week of tasty 13th gen leaks, on Friday, the Billy Billy user known as Enthusiastic Citizen, or ECSM underscore official, stated with much confidence that Raptor Lake will be revealed at Intel's innovation event on September 28th, followed by an October 17th launch, at least for the Case QCPUs and Z790 motherboards. Much like the Alder Lake launch, it looks like the non-Case Qs and the less expensive H760 and B760 motherboards won't be out until Q1 2023 after they're revealed at CES on January 5th. Keep in mind that we're still very much dealing with rumors here versus official announcements, but if these dates hold up, then it looks like Raptor Lake will drop a couple weeks after AMD's next-gen AM5 platform launch for Zen 4-based Ryzen 7000 series CPUs. The end of the year should be quite interesting for PC hardware, though. Intel's ARC A380 desktop GPU has been on the market for a few weeks now. If by on the market you count a very quantity and geographically limited debut in China. This means that units have finally made their way into the hands of a wider group of reviewers, and in particular a batch of reviews published Wednesday from Spain, Russia, and Germany have not been kind to Intel's first ARC series desktop solution. Performance typically lags behind AMD's slowest card in the Radeon 6000 series, the RX 6400, and trades blows with NVIDIA's three-year-old GTX 1650. The card is simply not usable without rebar, says Igor of Igor's Lab, and the Ganeer model most have been able to acquire appears rushed and quickly assembled with thermal pads too thick and too much thermal paste overall resulting in a not-approved rating from the well-respected media outlet, only the second time such an honor has been bestowed. Driver issues abound as well, resulting in poor frame time performance and an overlay that can block the entire screen. Wolfgang from Computerbase summed up the review experienced in the bluntest terms. Gaming with Intel's ARC 380, even with the latest driver, is like living in the middle of a minefield, playing while drunk. It is completely incomprehensible how a large and reputable company like Intel can sell such a product. So I guess I went too easy on Intel last week. Speaking of throwing Intel a bone, the United States Senate advanced the CHIPS Act on Tuesday, allowing the legislation to proceed with a potential vote for final approval slated for early next week. The vote was 64 to 34 in favor of a slimmed down version of the bill, which would still provide more than $50 billion in subsidies to US chip manufacturers, with Intel being one of the first in line to receive benefits. The bill seeks to further bolster domestic chip production with tax breaks to encourage the construction of plants based in the United States. Proponents of the bill say it will help the U.S. keep up with international chip-making competition, particularly versus companies in China, Taiwan, and Japan who have received significant subsidies from their respective governments. Opponents point out that companies like Intel are not exactly hurting for cash and ask why taxpayer dollars should be doled out to boost their business when the economy is in its current state of disarray. If you want to know what I think, well, actually, I think both of those are significant points worthy of consideration, but coming up with the best solution is unfortunately well above my pay grade. I would like to point out CNBC's remarkable choice of stock imagery in this case, though, to represent legislation that could underpin next-gen chip design for years to come. They went with a picture of an LGA 775 CPU from 2005. And, and yes, that's an A-bit motherboard. Remember A-bit? They went out of business in 2008. One upshot of the CHIPS Act is that chip makers who actually build fabs are keen to hitch their cattle car to that sweet, sweet gravy train. Samsung coincidentally sent over a massive proposal on Wednesday after the Senate's procedural vote, an Austin, Texas area build-out plan that includes 11 new fabs, a $200 billion investment, and up to 10,000 new jobs. Jobs are good, I think. Two of the facilities would be in Austin, and nine would be built 25 miles to the northeast in Taylor, which is in Williamson County. The earliest any would be finished is 2034, though, with others reaching completion in 2042. In return for their build-out investment, though, Samsung would receive just short of $4.8 billion in tax breaks over the life of the agreement. $4.8 billion ain't bad, but Intel could be on the receiving end of more than $20 billion in subsidies if the CHIPS Act gets through Congress prior to their August recess. The Senate might still make changes to the bill's details, though, which still aren't public, according to 
to Reuters. And there's a small detail that's TBD about whether the bill will support chip designers or just chip manufacturers. You may have heard of AMD, Qualcomm, and Nvidia, for example. They all design chips, but do not own their own fabs to produce them. They work with companies like Samsung and TSMC to actually produce the chips. Intel does own fabs, along with companies like Texas Instruments, Global Foundries, and Micron. And Intel in particular could see as much as a $20 billion financial boost if the bill passes. Competitors are not so happy about that, although they're not keen to go on record with public statements quite yet. An anonymous rep of one of the fabless chip design companies at least said as much. You have Intel that might get $20 billion with the Chips Act, plus $5 billion or $10 billion under the Fabs Act, so $30 billion billion goes to your direct competitor and you don't get a penny, that's going to cause problems in the market. Very true. And that makes sense to me. Let's switch gears to something that's hopefully less controversial though, although it does still involve the US government. Remember Ajit Pai, the former FCC chair who everyone hated because he was so obviously in bed with all the big ISPs and he had that big douchey Reese's mug too? His replacement, Jessica Rosenworcel, actually wants to give the public faster broadband internet by increasing the standards for what qualifies as minimum broadband speeds, as well as setting new long-term speed goals for the future. The current broadband standard is 25 megabits per second down and three up, which was last updated in 2015. The new standard would be 100 down and 20 up, which is way faster. Broadband standard definitions mean that ISPs can't, say, try to sell you a shitty bonded DSL connection that's barely faster than dial-up while telling you that you're getting broadband internet, a practice that plagues both rural communities and low-income neighborhoods. Those longer-term goals look good too, although there's not a specific timetable for them yet, but the national goal is 1 gigabits per second down and 500 megabits per second up, eventually bringing gigabit internet to all and sundry. Faster internet is good. I will tolerate no disagreements on this subject. Speaking of disagreeable things, we're getting closer to the end of the show. But fear not, there's still a lightning round of tech news to go. It's time for tech briefs. I've been monitoring this situation for some time now. Monitors, and companies making them who didn't use to make monitors. Corsair debuted their Xenia line in late 2021 with a single model, but they're now expanding that line with two new 32-inch displays as of Tuesday the 32UHD144 and 32QHD240. As the model names suggest, the former is a 4K display with a 144Hz refresh rate, and the latter is a QHD or 2560 by 1440 resolution with a 240Hz refresh rate. Both feature quantum dot technology, USB Type-C connectivity along with DisplayPort and HDMI, and variable refresh rate compatibility with FreeSync Premium or G-Sync signal inputs. The QHD model is 700 bucks, and the 4K model will cost you a cool grand. NZXT also jumped into the monitor market this week with Monday's posting of two new models dubbed the Canvas series. Both feature a 165 hertz refresh rate and 2560 by 1440 resolution with one 27 inch flat panel model and one 32 inch curved one. There are some differences between them like the 27 inch is an IPS panel whereas a 32 inch is VA, but the monitor housing and stand are both available in black or white and you can mix and match which combination you want on the NZXT store page. You can also buy these monitors without stands if you already have one, which can save you 40 bucks. But with the basic stands, the Canvas 27Q costs $360 and the Canvas 32Q curved costs $430. Moving along, researchers at the University of the Negev in Israel have introduced Satan to your PC. No, not the Prince of Darkness who rules over the desecration of the underworld, but a devious hack that can pull data directly from your SATA cable over the air by picking up on the faint radio signals that emanate from it as it communicates with a hard drive or SSD at six gigahertz speeds. Before you get too worried, there are significant limitations to this hack. Signals can only be read up to one meter away. Specific malware must be installed to modify the file system activity so it will generate identifiable radio signals. It just wouldn't work with newer hardware like an M.2 drive. And practically speaking, if you had that level of physical access to a machine, you could just pull the storage drive out and make off with it. But at least you'd have a good excuse. The devil made me do it. Get thee behind me, Sata. Meta, which used to be called Facebook, apparently didn't check or didn't care if another company was already using that name. And now Meta X LLC, a different Meta company focused on VR that's been around since 2010, has filed suit against Zuck's Meta company, which took on the moniker on October 28th, 2021. 
Meta X seems to have a pretty good point in how the Facebook parent company rebrand has affected their ability to do business. And despite ongoing communication between the companies, Meta platforms, AKA Facebook, has not budged in their unreasonableness and arrogance, according to the article, which appeared to be the staple character traits that Zuckerberg programmed his robotic replacement with so many years ago when he departed this earth in search of more old people to sign up for his social media platform. Speaking of old people, it turns out that we might not all be septuagenarians by the time Rockstar finally releases GTA 6. In fact, buzz about the much anticipated sequel to GTA 5, which launched in September 2013, has been rampant in the past couple weeks. Most notably, Rockstar is staffing up, with more than 220 job postings going up just in the past month. While official statements are still short on specifics, Rockstar has only said that they are working on a new entry in the Grand Theft Auto series as part of their wind down of additional updates to Red Dead Redemption Online, it does seem like something big is in the works and we could realistically see GTA 6 by 2024. If Rockstar's parent company, Take-Two Interactive, has anything further to add in the near future, it will likely be discussed when they reveal their first quarter financial results for the 2023 fiscal year on August 8th. Now that I've had some time to research though, let's get back to those suspicious goings-ons that I talked about in the intro. And it's big news. There will be no news or no tech news for about two weeks, according to my sources. That's right, all tech news the world over will cease and things will just be kind of chill and quiet and peaceful for a couple weeks. Sounds good to me. It's a good time of the summer for a bit of a break. It should help us prepare for the veritable orgy of product launches expected in the final four or five months of the year. So once again, no tech news for the next two weeks and this series will continue on August 14th. But there you have it guys, tech news for the week, indeed for the next three weeks or so. And if you liked it, click that like button or leave me a comment down below. While you're down there, all the articles I talked about today are linked in the description if you're interested. And you can check out my store at paulshardware.net for high quality merchandise, t-shirts, hoodies, beer sets, and more. Subscribing to my channel is always a good call too. Thanks again everyone, and we'll see you again soon.